And the answer is one, which is kind of, from the fragmented perception, it seems like, oh, it's going to, it seems like it's going to Well, take I knew this course was bad. <laughs> now I really know it's yeah. bad. One, you don't know how bad this world is, Jesus, but, but the ultimate basis behind that is that there's only one mind. And he's addressing it to the reader. In other words, it's, it's, it's such a big leap to think about it, but there, there is only one mind. And, and when the mind bites off the belief in separation, it seems then that the minds are contained within these bodies. In other words, it seems like Vicky has the mind of her own, and Ron has the mind of his own, and David, and so on and so forth. And that's the way it's experienced in this world. And that's the way Jesus addresses it. He, he knows that the mind is so convinced in separation, that so convinced that there are separate, real separate people with real separate minds. And that Nettie not only has a separate mind than David, according to this, but, but she also has a decision-making ability that's separate from mine. In other words, she could decide whether to come or whether not to come or whether to do this or that. And that's still all within the dream framework. The ultimate sense is that there's just one mind and it's my mind, you know, coming from this thing, is it's always addressed to the reader. And, and literally, it's my lesson all the time. That whenever we get into the thing like Dave was joking about, about other people's egos, and so on and so forth, that's a convenient distracted device for saying, for looking at what's my lesson, what's my decision here. So, the, so when he says only one teacher of God is needed, that just seems to practically lead to the next step, which is that it's already happened. If only one is needed, then it's like, it's already, it's, to me, it's like it's already there waiting for me as soon as I'm ready to recognize it, and then I know it says in the Course that as soon as I do recognize it, instantaneously I will realize that it's always been that way, that it never was not that way. I was just refusing to see any things the way yeah. they are. Yeah. <clears throat> to me, that helps to explain something like, if a, you know, a new baby comes into the world and you pinch it really hard and it starts to scream and cry, then, you know, it hasn't learned much here in this world, you know, enough to, you know, learn about things like, you know, that's an expression of guilt and an expression of a desire to die. But then when you start to take it to the idea that there is one mind that has made the decision or the choice to separate, that it just makes the tries to make the illusion as absolutely real and believable as possible. So when we come here as babies, so to speak, we're like really helpless against this illusion. Almost it seems like. Yeah. I don't know. If that makes In a sense, if we take it back one more step, remember that it's the mind that's sick and the mind that's guilty. So the form of a baby, or the form of of even thinking we come here, still gets into the idea that we're kind of born into bodies. It's, it's helpful to just think about it as, as, as the, the mind is the mind. The mind is where all the beliefs and thoughts are, and this, the screen where the where the babies are and, and the seemingly aging takes place and all these things, that's just the screen. Mm -hmm. And it's just the mind. Yeah. Well, what I was saying was that, that a baby doesn't seem to have choice. You know, but that's if you look at it as a separate entity. Yeah. If you think there's just one mind that made the decision, then that's where the choice lies way back from our conscious mind. Yes. You know, there's one mind behind all these seemingly separate conscious minds. And it's just like we're different expressions of one decision to fragment. And, and the thing too, it, it's like, uh, really what happens with a baby too, the reason it may seem as if babies don't have choice, like adults can make, you know, informed decisions, is that the, there's, a, there's a level confusion going on here, is that the brain is being confused with the mind. You know, the brain, obviously, the, the development of a baby's brain, if you trace it from an embryo on, you know, it's not, a baby's brain is not fully developed, neither, neither is in the uterus and so on and so forth. And remember, the brain and the body and everything on the world is just images on the screen. And that's where the confusion takes place, is if I associate the mind with the brain, I'll say, how can this child choose? This child's just an innocent victim, you know. The brain's not even fully fully developed, but the association that's being made is that the mind is being associated with the brain, and that kind of analogy. So as soon as you can start to see, you know, that the mind is not in the world, the mind is not confined into the body or into the brain. The mind is this expansive, powerful thing that's watching the script. And all of a sudden, then you can get away from these things like, what about the baby that's born with? You know, spina bifida, you know, and all those questions like, how could, why, 
how could this happen to such a child? Or what about the, the one-year-old that's raped? You know, how could how could this how could it be that the child wasn't a victim? The child was helpless. It, that's by taking it from out there on the screen. Whereas if you bring it back to the mind thing, that if the mind's guilty, it will call forth witnesses on the screen to prove to it that it's guilty. So really, yeah, believes. Really believes. I mean, the mind believes it's guilty. The farthest, the thing about one mind too, is it's that's that's the oneness in which this course is kind of leading towards. But the reason that that is is not apparent is because part of the duality is the subject-object split. It really does seem like we're individual persons in this world with with personal histories and with futures, you know, that are yet to come, and that there are other people that are in the same kind of boat. And you know, I can be the subject, and then everyone else is the object. In the end, you know, it's like a collapse of the subject and object are both seem to be just images on the screen. In other words, it's all the the pieces of the puzzle are all seen to be together instead of experienced as duality. as a duality. Yeah. It's all the same form. Yeah. The form doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what form it is. It's all the same. Yeah. <clears throat> so, when you said collapse like that, uh, we were reading a part of the course yesterday <clears throat> about it talks about the the bridge and the change in perception and uh, not to be afraid of it because it will it will <clears throat> actually be a a very short time and you won't be confused. Okay, but what you're talking about <coughs> is that when when the subject and object become part of the screen? Okay, that's what... All right. I think a, a clear analogy, too, in the Course is, is back in the 500s where it talks about the dreamer of the dream versus the dream, whereas within the world framework, it seems like that I'm a little person and I'm a little dream figure, and there are other dream figures moving around. And, and a good analogy for the mind is if you could pull back and just see that, that all of the figures are... All the bodies are just figures in the dream, and I'm the dreamer of the dream. Those are images that are that are in my mind. Just like at night, when you have a nighttime dream, you go to sleep and you have all these things that seem to happen and everything, and then you wake up and oh gosh, mm -hmm. so, yeah. I'm uh, not dreaming anymore. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, right, yeah. the experience, right? It's, it's, uh, it's just, you dream, huh? It was just all in my mind at night, you know. But it's like then it's like uh, I'm off into the real world, <laughs> you know. Yeah. And what the course is just saying is, no, no, it's it's still these are still figures that are moving in the dream, and you're still dreaming and everything. Now, so that idea, our first idea at the top is that obviously death takes many forms, but it's just it's just unrecognized. A lot of the forms are unrecognized as death. We don't think of them as death. And then if you drop down to the the last paragraph on 302. Anybody want to read that one? It is impossible to worship death in any form and still select a few you would, would not cherish and would not and would yet avoid while still believing in this. For death is total. Either all things die or else they live and cannot die. No compromise is possible. For here again we see an obvious position which we must accept if we be sane. What contradicts one, though, enti though entirely, cannot be true unless its opposite is proven false. And this idea, it kind of gets at the first principle of miracles, that there's no order of difficulty in miracles. In other words, we need to train our minds so highly that we, we aren't fooled by these unrecognized forms of death in any way, shape, or form they can take. That we become so clear and riveted to the Holy Spirit's purpose that we that <clears throat> we can train our minds that we're never victimized by external circumstances. Mm -hmm. It can certainly seem like um, it, it's a real hot day and I'm feeling very hot and it's humid and I'm feeling very uncomfortable. You know, it can certainly seem like it's the it's the temperature and the humidity that's <laughs> doing this to my body. And it's not recognized that this is just another form of death and that this is just a choice that I'm making in my mind. That the, that the discomfort I'm feeling is coming from a decision that I'm making in my mind and not from 
the 95 degree heat and the 95 degree temperature. But, and, and when we generally we can start to generalize or the course calls the transfer of training, we get better and better at, at applying this over and over and over to lots of different situations, then you start to get, reach the mind training like, a good example would be like the Zen, Zen Buddhist or the monks who, you know, you've heard the stories of putting them in, in cold chambers with their little g-string on or whatever and they're sitting there and it's below freezing or whatever and they're just calmly sitting there meditating. It's, it's the whole great example of mind over matter, literally, that when our minds get so highly trained there will be nothing external that will be able, we will believe, is able to take away our peace of mind or influence us in any way. Does that come with studying the course? I mean, that you could do that? Yeah, it's mind training. It's like... What? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's a different matter. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, I'm not there. <laughs> <laughs> but it's that's like fun. studying the course, and I would say more than just studying it, because that's like the first step, but it's applying the course. You know, Jesus says we don't want to just get... This isn't a course in theoretical ideas and speculation. But it's actually taking the lessons, you know, like one lesson a day and, and taking the central idea and just trying to carry that lesson through the day. That's where the, the transfer of training comes in. That's where the, the mind really starts to shift and starts to feel the power and the magnitude that lies deep within it. It's been covered over by all these false beliefs in weather and temperature, economics, nutrition. You know, he goes at other points of the course where he gets real specific and he just starts to rattle off Here's the things you believe in. You, know, you believe in rules of friendship and reciprocity, and you believe, you, you know, he talks about pills and protective clothing, and he just starts to rattle off the forms of magic and just believes that it needs to be happy and comfortable. But even with do doing all of that, it's still by just applying the lessons, which is so great to have a, a tool like this that you can use. It doesn't take much time, you know, to read. To, to read a lesson in the morning, and you can go and go about your activities and just hold the thought in mind. It's not like going, like the Zen Buddhist would go and meditate for like 12 or 16 hours a day, and he says in here that, that those paths have served others well, but, but this is a path that's been given for you that can really save, he calls the other methods, tedious and time consuming. Meditating 16 hours a day is... Time to do Let's make some more, uh, like, elaborate a little on, on these ideas, uh, because I guess there are different ways to go about that, and the course is, is one of them, but the other ones, it's not so much spiritual development, because somebody can, uh, I don't know, can walk on water or just be in a sub zero room. Oh, so in a room of sub zero temperature, you know, without any clothing and not to have any problem. But this doesn't necessarily mean that he's making the right choice at the level that the course is talking about. I mean, yeah. somebody, you know, can become a great tennis player and likewise can study under a master and, I don't know, know how to move pepsis with, you know, their eyes, you know, without touching them. But, but the idea is that the choice is not made at the level, okay, I, my mind chose to feel cold in, in uh, sub-zero temperatures, so therefore my mind now will choose to feel okay in sub-zero temperatures. It's not that type of choice. The right. choice is at the level where who am I and who is my brother and what is the world? The choice is at the level of how we view ourselves, other people in the world. Is it as God created them? Is it eternal? Is it spirit? Is it innocent? Is it completely whole? Or is it limited? Uh, subject to death, to dying, to, to suffering, to injuries, to accidents, to all kinds of things. And that's why it says all these things are death. Because really, any idea of ourselves that is not as God created us, is death. Because it is the death of, of eternal life. So even though the death of eternal life is not real, our <coughs> minds have believed that it is real. And it has become a little body, you know, with a little life, was subject to all kinds of suffering and finally death. And you know, if you see, you know, the difference between a body living and a body dying is so in infinitesimally small compared to the being a body and the glory of the Son of God as God created, the, created him, 
that really doesn't make any difference whether the body is walking, whether the body is collapsing, whether the body is suffering.